And then somewhere along the way, we kind of got into um, churches that were mostly just about the spoken word. But I think uh, beauty speaks to people at a very deep, poignant place. And I can't wait to see the variety of ways in which Samantha's generation and the one that follows it will leverage the arts and unleash them to communicate truth. In my mom's legacy, the use, the incorporation of the arts, I think what their generation gave us was um, we could show people that church didn't have to be boring, that it was really relevant. And we they used the arts to ask big questions and to honor some of the struggles that we bring to God every Sunday. And I saw them used in incredible ways that will inspire me still. I just think you, you spoke about aesthetic earlier. I think the aesthetic's gonna change and the form might change. But some of the core values, um, I hope, will remain. Are you drinking anything today? I have a Diet Coke. Diet me too. Coke. There you go. Wow. <laughs> Like mother, like daughter. <laughs> yep. That's right, my friends. Welcome to another episode of Christian Podcast. I said I'm going to the beach to save American souls. And I did that this morning for the first time ever. I went surfing. 41 years old, and for the first time ever, I went surfing with friends, and I felt part of my soul was saved. And I thought, what if I bring the beach to my podcast? So today we have not only one, but two, Nancy and Samantha Beach. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Doing good. Love your energy. <laughs> doing well. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Okay, so we have two beaches talking today. And the thing is that they are, I guess, they represent a millennial and a boomer and what's going on with the church in America. So, you know, I'm all about saving American souls. And I thought, what if we talk a little bit about what's been going on in America? Is there a problem? Is there something that needs to be fixed? Is there a generation that as they passed it on to the next generation, the incoming generation felt like everything was wrong, that the previous generation did everything wrong or not, but we're gonna find out today. So Nancy, um, welcome to the show. Can you tell us real quick a little bit about who you are, maybe what you do? and who your sure. daughter is. <laughs> I sure will. Well, uh, I have served in the church for many, many years in the local church. Um, my mo focus was mostly the arts, um, worship and the arts for many years at a large church. And then in 2010, I resigned from there. And since then, I've been doing a lot of leadership coaching. I coach uh, individuals and teams from all different kinds of churches and nonprofits. And I do some teaching and speaking. I'm a part of a church in downtown Chicago now called Soul City Church, which um, allows me the privilege of teaching sometimes. I bring the message. I, I just did that on Sunday, and I love, I love that church. Uh, my daughter, Samantha, I have two daughters. Uh, she's the older one. And to my great shock and surprise, she has entered into ministry herself. I didn't see Ooh. that coming. <laughs> I'll let her tell you about it. But she was a theater major in college. And uh, that's kind of where I thought she was heading. But she took a bit of a turn in the last couple years. Yeah, I uh, well, I spent about a decade pursuing the arts and still partnering with churches from time to time when they wanted a creative element in their services. And so I did that as just a freelancer and then um, started attending a church when I moved to Austin, Texas with my husband a few years ago that we really grew to love. And they eventually asked me if I would do some of the creative work um, as a staff in a staff capacity. And so I did. And now and really enjoyed that. And now we find ourselves um, moving to Raleigh, North Carolina, where I'll take on a new ministry role there at a church that's uh, all about creativity and storytelling. So it's a good fit. I love this. I love creative arts and that you both were involved in that. So uh, when I think of America, I think America, it's almost like at the forefront uh, when it comes to, yeah, I, I think when it comes to the gospel and creativity, I think America has inspired the world. Even I'm from Mexico. And when I look at some of the stuff that Mexico is doing for good or for bad, I feel like, man, it, it almost seems like we're replicating a little bit of the um, uh, the looks, the static, the, the aesthetic 
of the American church, right? Like a nice stage, lights, uh, things like that, you know, worship that sounds amazing. Um, and I say for good or for worse, because I think part of the conversation I wanted to have with you today is centered around this idea of, um, I mean, and even your book that I have right here behind me, it's called Next Sunday. And it's almost like this this idea of, there's there seems like, the American church is at a crossroads that there's some problems going on, you know, even denominations across the U S like big denominations are, are having like major issues that they're having to deal with. Um, and in general, I feel like what's going on in America, and this is going to be a little long, but, uh, bear with me, please, because I want to bring a little bit of my experience coming from Mexico. I think the American church has lived out a lot of what I, what I experienced in Mexico growing up, I grew up in a, in a Christian church um, here and there, you know, moving around and stuff, but always Christian. But I, I always thought, man, I'm at the fringes. Like the thing in Mexico is Catholic. The Catholic church is big and everybody in Mexico is Catholic. Um, <laughs> and they go to church like once or twice a year. Right. And that's, that's the rhythm. And I feel like America is experiencing that where, okay, everybody's Christian and yes, we go to church like every now and then. And and I feel like now it's barely like, no, now it's actually it's almost like th the train stopped and all the baggage is catching up and saying, whoa, 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 like what is Christianity in the first place, right? So from one generation to the other and having lived here in America, have you experienced that? Is that part of maybe what you're talking about in the book next Sunday? Is that, no, is that a little bit of the problematic that you have encountered or what's your vantage point? Yeah, definitely. I, th I mean, we are seeing people, studies show that people are going to church less and less, and um, especially young people are leaving the church in droves. And so I think it's not just that that's what we're witnessing, but we're interested in asking why. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't claim to speak for all millennials at all. Um, I had an interesting vantage point from my career in the arts because I worked with a lot of people who would consider themselves very spiritual, who would never set foot in a church or feel comfortable in one. Um, and so getting to know their stories helped illuminate for me. And what I see just among my friends is that is a generation that grew up with the internet and so was exposed to more and more injustice and the experiences of people who were not like us in a way that's unlike maybe any other generation's exposure to other people, to other people groups. And, um, I think as that happened, um, we both want a place where we can learn to be more loving and learn to transform our communities. And at the same time, we started to ask hard questions about our institutions, including the church and want the church to be reconciling or reckoning with those issues as well. Um, so I wonder if that's a piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Nancy, do you want to add to that? Like what's your vantage point when it comes to maybe the problematic in the U S with the church? Yes, there are many problems <laughs> with the church, <laughs> um, but we weird. try to write a book of hope, you know, because we, at the mm. same time, we have hope for the church and we don't expect it to be a perfect institution, but, you know, st we, you can't have to look at reality. And as Samantha said, statistics show us that, especially the younger generation, but really lots and lots of people no longer consider frequent church attendance to be uh, important to them enough to, to show up. And of course the pandemic complicated things uh, even further with that, although many churches are now trying to gather again. Um, I think each generation looks at what came before it and basically says, you know, what's working and what do we need to let go of and what do we need to change? And my generation certainly did that, the baby boomers. Um, we actually, uh, the church that I helped to build was radically different from anything that our parents um, had created. Mm -hmm. And we were a little arrogant, maybe more than a little. And I think we <laughs> thought we knew how to do church and we're going to do it our way and all of that. Um, and then, you know, I'm humbled by the fact that a couple decades later, I sit at a table and hear from the next generation that there's a lot of things they're not so content with in what we created. And uh, I think that's the way it goes. You know, we, we, each generation says, okay, we're going to inherit some things but we also want to change some things. And I, I actually think that there's been some really good voices of the young people uh, toward what church could be going forward. And it's a little different than what, you know, what they inherited. Mm. Okay. So let's talk about inheritance. 
Um, that's that's very interesting right there. And especially, you know, as I read a little bit of your background, um, there's this word, right, mega church. And I feel like a little bit of maybe what people have inherited, even what I'm saying that I'm experiencing that people are kind of like doing in Mexico. It's a little bit of, oh, okay, we're, if, if we have the right music, if we have the right message, uh, more people come, right? And it's it's basically the, the elements that build the mega church, right? And so anyways, whatever will happen in Mexico will happen in Mexico. But here, I feel like that's exactly a system that was inherited. And maybe the newer generation, maybe millennials or, or even the younger ones, I feel like they just have a mistrust with institution anyways, right? So if it's in institutionalized Christianity, even the more so, you know, they feel, they feel uh, some sort of animosity towards that. So uh, how do you feel about, I mean, not, not to put blame or anything, you know, because I think, do you ever feel like what you were creating had substance? Do you feel like what you were building was, okay, this impacted a generation for the good? Or did you feel like ultimately it was like the wrong approach, like all together? Oh, that's a great question. And of course, I just have one viewpoint on this. I don't pretend to speak for everyone, but mm. I I think it's a mix. I really do. I think there were some good things um, and some good fruit that came from the uh, generation that I was a part of in recreating church. I think we helped people see that Christianity could be relevant and could uh, really uh, transform their everyday lives. I think we reached out to non-churched people with a lot of intentionality, and that hadn't really been happening prior um, to that movement. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, everyone would admit that there's been some downsides, particularly to the huge, large churches, um, which can foster a culture of celebrity and can start to feel to some young people too much like a performance. And uh, Samantha has said many times that the question she's hearing from her generation is, can this institution be trusted? And there's good reasons for that lack of trust. Mm, wow. Samantha, so uh, maybe as a recipient of that inheritance, do you think that what's been built now will last once we pass it to the next generation? Do you feel like they'll feel that, that same thing? Or do you feel like we're in a better transition into passing whatever we're building into the next generation? Yeah, I, I think it's going to evolve. But I think that that's how it seems to me. That's how ch our church history has always been. And, um, mm. you know, when they built these huge, huge buildings, we probably couldn't envision a world where we can all be connected um, through our devices every day. And so the need to gather thousands and thousands of people um, is different now. And and I also think, you know, I, I, there are things I'll take with me and primarily in my mom's legacy, the use, the incorporation of the arts. I think what their generation gave us was um, we could show people that church didn't have to be boring, that it was really relevant. And we, they use the arts to ask big questions and to honor some of the struggles that we bring to God every Sunday. And I saw them used in incredible ways that will inspire me still. I just think you, you spoke about aesthetic earlier. I think the aesthetic's going to change and the form might change, but some of the core values um, I hope will remain. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. For the next question, I just need my coffee right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's right here. Are you drinking anything today? I have a Diet Coke. Diet me too. Coke. There you go. Wow. <laughs> like mother, like daughter. <laughs> yep. <laughs> From a distance, cheers. 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 <laughs> okay, that's so good. So I love the arts, and I think that's one of the things that maybe even gives me hope when I think of the church. And I would say, like, why do you think? Uh, I feel like the, the church of the future is going to be so intertwined with art, with with even what I'm trying to do right here, you know I mean? I, I love a place that looks nice and stuff like that. And I feel like there's some art to that, right? To the background, to the colors, to the tone, to things like that. Um, even to the creation of a podcast itself, I feel like there's some sort of art form in, in, in the message that you want to bring, right? So 
when I think of the church of the future and the hope that you guys are talking about and the creative arts, why does it seem like those go hand in hand? Do you think like we'll ever be able to separate? Because, okay, this will be maybe another long question, but okay, let's think a little bit of maybe the Renaissance or this era where Christianity or religion in general felt like it was so intertwined with art, right? It felt like it was one in the same, even when you think of Mozart or Beethoven. I mean, some of the, the, the music that's still played today, I mean, hundreds of years later, um, it was made for, for like church environments, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's, that's, that's super, that's genius. You know, even, even I think I'm thinking right now of, um, my atheist friends in Mexico who said, oh man, I love this piece of art by, uh, whichever, no X or Y or Z, um, classical musician, right? And to think that what they were creating had so much elements, so much like spirituality to it, right? And so anyways, the question is, how are the arts intertwined nowadays? Will we ever be able to separate them? Um, what's your involvement when it comes to the arts and the church and bringing a message? Like how how are we supposed to do it in 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 a better way, maybe in a way that, um, well, I'll just leave it at that. Like, what are you witnessing when it comes to that? What is the, what I'm saying? What does it uh, spring up in your, in your minds? Go ahead, mom. Well, I'm very excited about this church that Samantha is going to be joining the staff of because one of their fundamental values is for beauty. Mm. And I think there is something about beauty that, inspires every human being. It's just very connected to how we were created. And when we see something beautiful, it stirs something in us and it lifts us. And I think you're absolutely right, Beto, that in the past, the church commissioned artists, you know, especially mm -hmm. painters and, you know, Michelangelo and all these people were, were employed by the church and they were capturing beauty on a regular basis And then somewhere along the way, we kind of got into um, churches that were mostly just about the spoken word, and it seemed like we lost some of that value of beauty. Mm. Um, but I think uh, beauty speaks to people at a very deep and very um, poignant place, and I can't wait to see the variety of ways in which Samantha's generation and the one that follows it will leverage the arts and unleash them to communicate truth. I'm really mm. looking forward to that. Wow. Okay, Samantha, so before you answer, uh, I just want to add this as I'm thinking, I have emojis, right? So I'm mm -hmm. thinking, when I think of the arts, especially, uh, I feel like there's a spectrum of belief, if you may. Uh, so anyways, I have blasphemous, inspired, skeptical, holy, and divine. So especially within the blasphemous and the divine, I feel like there's a lot of that in the arts. I feel like there's art that makes you feel things, that makes you have emotions and reactions, like very visceral, very uh, shocking, right? Almost like, a, almost like to the point of blasphemous. Uh, mm -hmm. And even when I think of memes, like nowadays, you know, the, the, the newer generation, like memeing about everything and even memeing about the church and about Christ, That, in a yes. sense, I mean, leans to the to the blasphemous, but they're still doing it within maybe the the boundaries of art. So, yeah. all that to say, what what are the good boundaries, or maybe does art should art be tamed when it comes to the church? What's your experience? What is your hope? What is your wish? It's a good question. I don't, I especially with the first draft, I don't think we should make art with gloves on for the church because. I, I really think one of its amazing functions is to say what the preacher or pastor never can. And to, mm -hmm. especially because we always know that that person is there ultimately to preach. So there, when we talk about trust and our generation trying to build back trust with this institution, when we know a lesson's coming at the end of it, we don't always trust the really honest question or the honest confession mm -hmm. um, or fear. And I think art doesn't bear the burden of needing to resolve anything. It can just stand in that gap of, um, of feeling or questioning that so many of us have. And we all know that God's big enough for that. So I, I, I don't know that there's a lot of things we should be scared of saying or asking in church. 
I think as long as, as we're doing it with the spirit of God, we, we long to be closer to you, but these things sometimes get in the way. And I think when we capture those feelings, um, people who have tiptoed back into church start to feel seen and safe. And so you know, for me, in a really, in a specific way, I, I create theatrical stuff and, um, I would be hired by churches a lot of times around Christmas to help write something for their service. And I knew at that time of year, especially there were so many people in the room who um, don't come any other time of year. Right. And I always tried to write for them and just name maybe some of the barriers just so they know we see it and that, and that they're not alone. And then the rest of the service can do what it will do and God will do what only God can do. But, and the other thing I'll add is just that I think, I think we've tried to think our way to God in our country for a long time. Oof. And I don't think we've gotten there. And it's such a mystery that I think the arts are far better equipped to help express. Wow. That think our way to God. I, I totally see that like everywhere. Uh, that makes total sense, at least in my, you know, from my vantage point. Uh, and that's so helpful. So I love that you're talking about honest question I love that you're talking about maybe art has a way of saying what the pastor or the preacher can never say. Uh, so even when I think of podcasting, excuse me, um, one of my inspiring podcasts that almost like made me start this on my own show was called The Bad Christian Podcast. And I think now evolved almost into like, they don't even do <laughs> a Christian podcast anymore. Uh, they're just kind of like comedy or whatever. But when I was listening to it, it was basically because they were talking about things that normally you don't hear about in church, right? So the things that the pastor doesn't preach. So in the general sense, I feel like now that, that people are more used to podcasts and finding content online and things like that, uh, even outlets like this or many other podcasts that are around, I feel like they're, they're a voice within the capital C church to talk about these matters, right? To talk about maybe the things that you won't necessarily hear in church. But I also love that you're saying you're intentionally creating a space within the arts to say, here are these questions. I know some people that are going to be exploring our, our play or our performance maybe don't have a faith background. So you're talking about some barriers that you even named. So would you... Would you name a few of those? Maybe would you name a few of the things that you think we were not able to preach from a pulpit that need to be addressed within the art or the podcasting or other you know, other context, but also all, all relevant to what is the church, right? Yeah. Oh, it's a long list. Well, I think we could all be braver from the pulpit. I don't think these things should necessarily be excluded from there either. But mm. thinking specifically like about the Christmas example, I think that can be a hard time of year for someone to enter into a church because there's so much going on personally and socially. And so when I started to think through what would make it hard to come to church that time of year, um, you know, the, the, it was, it had been a year I'm trying to remember, I think it was 2016. It was a year with a lot of division in our country, mm. a year with more um, mass shootings, a year with things that make it feel like, how could I possibly come and believe in good news, the good news of Christmas or that, that just maybe it felt like the temperature of our culture at that mm. time might be hard for people who weren't walking with God to um, experience hope. And so sometimes I think we, we, the church or the pastors rush to hope without always naming some of these um, things that make it feel hard to honestly believe in God right now. So, yeah. So I think about things that are happening in our culture. I think about division, racism, um, and we're being braver about addressing these things from the pulpit now too, but mm -hmm. um, churches are getting creative. A church we know, or the church my mom's a part of started doing a blue Christmas where it was just a service for people who were walking through grief at that time of year. And wow. that's, That's an experience that can be, um, I can make it hard to enter into the main service sometimes um, if what's going on personally is so big. Mm -hmm. But those are just a few examples. Wow, that's that, uh, Nancy. So tell me about that uh, blue Christmas concept. I mean, was it, I don't know, I'm just picturing like everybody's super sad, but <laughs> tell me a little bit about the yeah. hope or, or even um, the reasoning behind that. That's super interesting that you had a space specifically for that. Yeah, I wasn't um, the primary person behind it, but what, what I experienced when I checked it out was that 
it, there was an acknowledgement that some people are very tender at that, at that time of year. And it stirs up a lot of sense of loss and grief for some family loss and uh, unmet expectations. You know, the, the holidays just stir all of that up. And so, no, it wasn't like a um, depressing experience so much as a time of comfort and naming, you know, just like Sam said, these people want to be seen, want someone to, to get it, you know, that someone gets that this is a hard year for me. Uh, and then they can usher in some space for people to be silent, to pray, to process, to sing, even if you're singing with a kind of uh, shaky voice, you know, just trying to hold on to hope. And so I think that's the intent, especially with the massive amount of mental health issues that we have these days uh, in our country. I also think um, we have to have churches that make room for doubt. Um, I, I think these questions Samantha's talking about, I think sometimes we've tried, my generation especially, to be so clear about everything. Here's the three steps to this, and here's the answer to that. And we try to fix everything before we acknowledge that some people are doubting uh, whether God even exists. If he does, is he good or not? How can the world be um, so full of pain? And is God really powerful, or why doesn't he fix stuff? Why doesn't he change stuff? You know, and so we've got many, many, you know, millions of people really wrestling with doubt and we need to welcome it rather than squish it. You know, we need to make space for them. Wow. To make space for doubt. That that's unbelievable. I love it. And you're talking about the fixer generation really. And um, that makes sense again. You know, I'm just trying to Think of me like as a Mexican who's been living in America for 17 years, and I'm trying to, to put words into my own experience and journey. And I feel like, in a sense, I am here to, I mean, I, I say kind of like jokingly, right, to save American souls. But I am here to put my my little piece of the the puzzle, maybe, or try to bring my own, my own um, sense of, this is what I can do to add hope to uh -huh. our generation and to America and hopefully to our world, right? But anyways, with all that to say, when I think of the fixer generation, I even think of, yes, there was a sense maybe in the, in, in the boomer generation or prior to that where America fixes things, right? America fixes the world. America yeah. came to you know, save World War II and save a bunch of people. So it's like, yeah, you know, like we're doing good. We're doing amazing. And now it seems like all of that has fumbled a little bit more or a lot more. And the newer generation, this is the, this is the phrase I've heard from people in Mexico that some, some people are calling it the crystal generation because it feels like, mm -hmm. oh man, we, we can't even touch you because you break. Right. So, uh, mm. I mean, there, I feel like there's a little bit of that, but even Samantha, you were saying that our generation grew up with the, well, without the internet and then the internet kicked in and then the internet opened us up to people's experiences. And also what I've noticed with this is that, uh, and this is maybe a struggle, right? But when experience kicks in, then it all becomes my experience is my truth. And therefore, whatever I've experienced, you have nothing to say. And I feel like that's a little bit of that crystal thing, right? Oh, man, like, uh -huh. you don't know what I've gone through. And therefore, if you if you get too touchy, you're going to poke the wrong buttons, you know, and I'm going to get mad or whatever. And I mean, to think that the year you referred, 2016, in America, that it was so, I, I would say, maybe crystallized. Think of like the... A car when you it has the window and you throw a rock and it crystallizes and all it needs is somebody to push it and everything's gonna crumble down, right? So it felt yeah. like it was ready to do that. The wall was there with the glass and it was already shattered and broken. And it felt like all it needed was like the little the little push and everything was gonna crumble. So yeah. when I think of that, um you're saying we gotta bring the The newer generation, it's it's more open to doubts, and the older generation maybe it needs to be open to allowing the doubts. And how can we do it in a way? Because when I think of scripture, personally, right? Maybe I'm wrong, but what do you think of this? When I think of scripture, I think 
you know, Jesus is the solid rock and things like this where, where it seems like there needs to be a solid foundation to build upon anything, right? So how can we be sure that whatever we're building, we're building upon a solid foundation and not um, sandy sandy ground that, man, this, this house we're building is amazing, but in 20 years it's going to be super crooked. Do you see <laughs> anything of like that or what's your vantage point? Mm, it's a great, great question. Um, you know, I don't think Jesus or the church will crumble because of good questions that we ask in church. I think mm. Brian McLaren, who's a writer that I love, says the church of the future will be faith expressed in love, not expressed in beliefs. Oof. And I feel like we will know that we're up building on a solid foundation by the fruit of the churches that we're building and continuing to be part of. And so are they serving the community? Are people becoming more loving in community with each other? Um, is it a church that's including rather than excluding? I think those markers will will do the job. And there's plenty of room inside of that for complexity and mystery and doubt and faith and devotion. Um, but I think it's really going to be about the, f the fruit of those churches. Yeah, we um, devoted... Uh, entire chapters to this idea of what is the church like from Monday through Saturday, you know, and we really think all generations, but particularly, I think the next generation is looking at the church and saying, are you making any kind of impact or difference with the huge problems that we have in every community? You know, are, is there anything that you're doing that we could point to and say, well, there's, love. There is, you know, faith expressed in love, as she, as she mentioned. And so, uh, we believe that churches that are just insulated and all about themselves are never going to uh, grow, really, because people want to know if that church is a bright light, if that church is um, willing to serve, willing to get their hands dirty and get out there and do something to make a difference. Oof, that's so good. So I'll tell you real quick a story that's happening here in my community where churches have come together. And it's really under this umbrella called Trellis, which evolved. Trellis was like, okay, we, we want to bring businesses, churches, and what was the other civic engagement? Well, anyways, there were like three core uh, pillars that they wanted to bring from the community to participate together in the biggest challenges of the city. And they said we're a trellis because when you have a um, when you have the plant growing on the trellis, what you see is the plant. You don't really see what's holding it. And mm. they said that's what we want to be. We want to be almost like the backbone of this, but we want it to flourish, and we want people to see what's going on um, and the beauty of it outside. Right? Not it's, it's not to point to us and what we're doing. And then that evolved into something even more tangible. And I'm going to share it, and there's a little bit of, I mean, there's a lot of good, but there's also some questions that I have, right? So anyways, it evolved into Love Costa Mesa, which is the name of our city, and now it's been kind of replicated in other cities in California. So Love Orange, Love Anaheim, Love Modesto, oh. and you know whatnot. So anyways, that's great that it's growing, and, and basically what it looks like is bringing these three pillars, right, church and civic engagement, and what was the other one? Businesses, right? So bringing those three together and tackling the problematics of the city. So in a very tangible way, we said, let's have a love customers a day in which people can participate in many different ways. Some people will write letters to the, to the authorities, right? To the, to the person that work as police, chaplain, as police or as firemen or as the city advisors and all of that, uh, people writing letters to the teachers, etc. And all of that was lovely. We even did projects where we were painting houses, painting our neighbors' houses. So it was amazing. It was so tangible, so tangible. But here's the thing. We were painting our neighbor's house, whose leg has just been amputated. Um, I think some, you know, some health issues. So he gets home. And the manager says, hey, you got to paint your house or you're out of here. And this, per this man is like, man, I just had my, my leg amputated. How am I going to even do that? Like, I don't even know how to ride a, a chair yet, right? 
we all came in, you know, the community came together as part of Love Costa Mesa. We painted his house. The house looked amazing. He was so grateful. And this is this is going to be super dark. But he committed suicide like a few weeks later. Right. And it just burdened me and pained me so much. Like, man, like we're trying to do something so tangible, trying to bring hope to people. And it almost felt like it it almost felt like that was not enough. Right. To be yeah. to completely honest. So when I think of the church doing great things, I feel like that is great. And I feel like some people really need it. Right. Some people will 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 maybe be saved by that. But back to my first point, when I said I'm going to the beach to save America, why do you think of this? Because and this is again, this is just my take. But I feel like what America needs the most right now is friendship. I feel like friendship yeah. is missing. It's broken. There's there's basically zero friendships going on. And I yeah. feel like that's what's not keeping society together. You know, you don't have someone to lean on. You don't have someone to bring your burdens to. And I thought this was my first day. And again, <laughs> sorry that not to make it kind of like about my stories and stuff like that. But it is my show and I want people to get to know <laughs> me too. So anyways. Um I went to the beach for the first time with my friends and part of what I was doing, it was so simple. It was just enjoying the time in the, in, in the ocean, falling a lot of times because I, I only was able to get up on the surf one time on the surfboard. But it was life-giving. And when I think of life-giving, I think almost like life-saving. My younger son, he was... He was, um, he loves like these little skateboards <laughs> that are called like tech decks. They're like miniature skateboards that you <laughs> use with your fingers. And he got a couple of them. And he said somewhere in the, in the, the tagline of, of this uh, packaging said, you know, saving something, right? I, I forgot what it said. But he basically said, yes, they saved my life. And I was a little curious to say, how did this little skateboard save your life? I mean, you're 12. And he said, because it brought me a friend and I met a friend and now we all like do this fingerboarding together. And I thought, wow, in my 12 year old uh, mm. concept of saving means friendship. And yeah. I thought, what if that's a little bit of what America needs, at least to some extent, at least to some level? What do you feel of, of that whole story? What, what, what's your reaction? What do you think? Is that true? Is that not true? Uh, is that part of it? Um, what do you think? Well, there is uh, chronic loneliness in this country. Mm. It, it, it is uh, so sad how many people don't feel connected to anyone. And I'm so sorry to hear the story of that man who clearly felt so alone and thought that was his only option. And I think uh, our whole first chapter is about community because we believe that the church is this unique place and it's got a lot of problems and you know we all are aware of them. But it is the one place where you can go and across age lines and barriers, across racial barriers, across uh, gender, all of that, you can actually build community with people. And, and if you take some steps and other people take some steps toward you, there can actually be friendships that are made. And you're right, Beto. Every every study shows that um, people's physical health is being greatly affected by the fact that they're just plain lonely and they don't have friends. And I think that's not how God designed us. He designed us to be in a community, in a family of people where we feel known and seen and loved and where we find purpose in, in serving one another. So I think that's one of the, the most vital parts of a church community. Mm, so good. Samantha, you want to add to that? Mm, it was very well said, but I couldn't agree more. Love it. Okay, so my last question would be this along these lines. What should the next Sunday look like? I was just reading a book by Madeline Langle, and she says, Jesus said to feed my people, not count them. And Oof. so many churches have cared more about counting that I've always gotten hungry, is what she said. Wow. Um, so I don't think it's about counting. I, I, I think... Um, when we, the more Christ-like a community and its individuals become, growth will happen and, and city transformation will happen. Um, what does next Sunday look like? I think that there is a big 
uh, reckoning that needs to happen sooner than later in a lot of churches around some of the people who feel who have been excluded and oppressed, honestly, but particularly by the white American church and some of our allegiances. And I think the braver churches get about naming that. And even if it wasn't our particular actions that led to that, it's our history that we're standing in. I think as we see churches get braver and more self-aware, um, we will experience and feel freedom both in the pews and from the stage to name some of these hard things. We don't have to have it all figured out, but I think there's going to be, a, I hope to see a season of lament over some of these things, which is not without hope. It's actually connected to hope, I think, because the hope is that we're not treating people this way anymore. And so that's where the lament comes from. And that's not what God calls us to. And then beyond that, I hope that next Sunday is full of the arts, as we've been talking about, full of creativity as a way to express in new ways and new stories, how God's love is moving and, and um, how we're uh, struggling as people and still wanting it and chasing it. And I do hope that it's full of um, authentic relationships and that we're all learning how to be better at including people and welcoming people in and building friendships across the lines or algorithms that we would typically associate with. Mm, So good. And Nancy, what does next Sunday look like for you? Well, we talk about it like it's Sunday, like it's just one day a week. And we um, that's not how it fleshes itself out actually in the book. And what we believe is Sunday is sort of the catalyst mm. um, for the rest of the week. But we really believe that the gathering still matters. And there are some who think that the future of the church means that everything will just be online and we don't really need to ever come together. And I, I think there's a loss in that and community is a part of it. And experiencing God's presence as a community is very different than being in your living room with your screen. Um, so I'm hoping that the future of the church will emphasize the value of that gathering while at the same time saying that is just the beginning. If there's nothing else that happens th- throughout the week, um, that's not really church. Um, I also like to add, just because it's so present of my mind right now, when Samantha was talking about lament, um, we need a spirit of humility. And we saw that, I think, yesterday, when we're recording this, um, just yesterday, the Pope was in Canada and he was apologizing, um, really just repenting, I guess you could say, for the church's actions against the native peoples um, in Canada years ago. And of course, he wasn't even alive when this was happening. But like Samantha said, he he is a part of the institution and he is going there to say, we are sorry. We are deeply sorry for the huge uh, violation and mistakes that we made with children um, of those native tribes. And to me, it was just a great example of saying, if the church is willing to be humble and saying, we we messed up, we didn't get it right. I think people are going to be willing to give grace and say, you know, as long as it's an authentic confession and we have humility saying we want to we want to do better, we want to be better going forward, then I have great hope for the church. Um, but we've got to let go of our pride and our, our attitude that we've got to be right all the time and be open to listening and to hearing from people who have felt excluded. So good. Okay, my takeaway is we don't have to be right all the time. And for that, I'm going to go to the gods of Emojitron to have an emoji reaction to this episode. And we'll see what emoji it is. Inspired emoji. I feel inspired with this episode. The beach has offered me hope. I'm so, 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 so glad for this conversation. Thank you so much. Would you pinpoint people to where they can find more about your book and where they can find it, maybe? They can go to the beach to get saved. <laughs> <laughs> the beach or Amazon or anywhere where books are sold. It's called Next Sunday. And um, we post about it on our social media. I'm on Instagram at Samantha Beach K. All right, my friends. Well, thank you for watching and listening today. Again, my name is Beto Gudiño, and I hope you can visit us at christianpodcast.com where you can have more of in-depth of our episodes. 
And please like, subscribe to this episode, share them with a friend, give us a positive review and rating wherever you're listening, whether it's Roku TV, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all of those goods. I'll see you guys on the next one.